Hi folks, there's no need for you nor I to become battery experts. When I ordered my first vape, I didn't know a battery from a banana. I just ticked the box which said include a battery, and it arrived with a Samsung 25R, which actually performed brilliantly. And if I'd chosen a vape with a built-in battery, then I could have saved myself even this bother. But if you are interested in a light-hearted chat about these fascinating little devices, then stick around for a while. Lithium ion cells come in a few different sizes, but those used in vapes are mainly these, and they're so called because of their dimensions. For example, the common 18650 is 18 mil diameter by about 65 in length, and cells are also available in protected or unprotected types. But this length figure that we quoted only really applies to the unprotected ones. The protected are a few millimeters longer and won't normally squeeze into a device designed for unprotected cells. Also, unprotected cells normally have a flat top, whilst protected often have a button top. But the extra length is mainly down to a tiny circuit board built into, well, normally the negative side. And if we remove the outer wrap, then we can actually see this. And these little boards are a reliable way of protecting the health of the cell by preventing conditions that might cause electrical damage or maybe even just shorten the life of the cell. But great as these boards are, Vapes almost always use unprotected cells, which don't have them, mainly because boards like this wouldn't be able to handle the higher current drain requirements of vapes. So does that make unprotected cells unsafe? Well, even unprotected cells have basic built-in protection. For example, they have an inbuilt cutoff which vents excess internal pressure in the event of overheating or similar. But all of the other protection functions I mentioned will still be implemented, but this time by the vape device itself, where they'll be combined with a charging function and interface to the mod's microcontroller for extra control and monitoring. But obviously this won't help us when unprotected cells are stored outside the mod, so instead of risking a short circuit by having them rolling around your pocket, maybe keep them in proper battery boxes, which can be bought cheap from eBay, and they're highly recommended. One important cell property is the continuous discharge rating, which is a benchmark for how much current a cell can continuously deliver within an allowed temperature threshold. So what sort of CDR rating should we be aiming for? Well, you'd expect vape manufacturers to make explicit recommendations here, but many of them don't. I checked 30 different Modbox user manuals, and most of them vaguely quoted like high drain or amperage figures without saying whether it was continuous or intermittent. I only found four proper CDR mentions, and these were all for 18650s, rated at 25 amps or above. And here are just a few cells that meet that spec. Well, when I'm evaluating a cell, I check the manufacturer's data sheets or information from another trusted source. Battery Mooch and Ligate are both online and battery gigs, and they both published test results from many different cells. These are highly recommended, and I'll include a few links in the description. But can we get away with using a battery with a lesser CDR than 25 amps? Well, in fact, some cells are specified to operate in excess of the CDR, but with certain constraints like duty cycle or temperature limits. But we can't really assume that all cells are rated like this, so maybe that's one reason why it's generally safer to stick to operating within the CDR. But how do we relate our chosen wattage to a cell's CDR? Well, one rule of thumb is to take your cell's CDR rating, multiply it by three, and that gives you an allowable wattage per cell that you can use in your vape device. So if you're vaping at, say, 60 watts, then maybe a 20 amp CDR cell would be best. So get yourself over to Mooch's and Ligate's platforms and just see what they're recommending. Another rating is the capacity in milliampere hours, which is a measure of how much charge the battery can hold. But be aware that capacity is a trade-off for CDR, so you're not going to find a cell that's got both the highest capacity and the highest CDR rating. And the higher CDR is probably the one to go for in vapes. Now when you're buying, be aware that fake cells, e-waste recoveries rewrapped as new, cells with impossible ratings and misleading vendor claims are all too common. And here's some that will give you a laugh. See these AliExpress beauties? Well, the maximum possible capacity for an 18650 is currently about 3,500 mAh, so obviously these claims are utterly ludicrous. And here they seem to be listing genuine Samsung 35Es, proudly proclaiming them to be 20 amp sustainable discharge, which, well, you might assume that would make them vape friendly. But even Samsung's own datasheet only claims 8 amp CDR, and this figure was also matched by Mooch's and Ligate's independent tests. 
So yeah, why not look up proposed retailers on Trustpilot and maybe send him a mail? You know the kind of thing I'm saying. Why not get a feel for him so you end up with something suitable and genuine? And when your battery arrives, don't be surprised to see it with a warning label telling you it's not for vaping. Now, it might look alarming, but in my opinion, it's just for liability avoidance and it doesn't really affect anything we've been saying here. Now, you'll be aware that lithium ions need to be charged in particular stages, which of course should happen autonomously when connected to a suitable charger. And although they've got a normal quoted voltage of 3.7, the voltage is actually 4.2 when fully charged and it gradually falls lower as they discharge. The mod's protection circuitry normally prevents them falling much under 3 volts, but cells might go a bit lower if, for example, they've been left flat for a long time. Now, deeply discharging is never going to improve cells, and you might prefer a replacement. But depending upon the severity of the discharge, if a correctly applied revival charging is successful, then there are credible sources indicating that they can often return to a useful life thereafter. Now obviously, it's entirely about personal preference here, but if you're interested in reading up on the details, I'll include a few links in the description. So if our cell is less than about 3 volts, charging begins with a gentle revival charge, which protects the chemistry of an over-discharged cell. Some chargers can charge right from 0 battery volts, while others won't charge at all in this state, and still others time out with a fault indication if the battery voltage doesn't rise as expected. Now once the battery voltage rises to about that 3 volts, the charge current increases to its fast rate as set by the charger configuration. Some chargers cut out if the battery drifts outside a certain temperature range. Now although it might be different for the latest fast charging power delivery technology, the chargers built into many mods needs to work with various qualities of USB power supplies. So maybe that's one reason why the charge current is generally set much lower than the maximum cell charge rate but it means that there's little risk of heat build-up, which could shorten the life of the cell. When the cell voltage rises to 4.2, it's pegged at this to allow a gradually reducing current until it falls to a nominal point and then cuts off completely and goes into an idle mode. So there's no risk of any damage through overcharging, no matter how long the battery stays plugged into the charger. And most chargers actually have an auto top-up, which reactivates the charging if the cell voltage falls back down to a certain lower threshold. Now sure, this process might appear complicated, but in fact the hardware to automate it's been around for years, cost mere pennies, and from the manufacturer's datasheet specifications, I'm assuming it works very effectively. And in fact, here's a few chips that are made especially to manage this process. In fact, eBay's cheapest charger implements an LTA7, and it's detailed in a BigClive.com video. I'm sure it's not desperately fancy, but I personally wouldn't have a problem using one. But the point is, it's theoretically simple and cheap to implement safe and effective charging in almost any device. But does that include our vapes? Well, Vaping MacGyver's published internal charging capabilities of a range of vapes, not all of his tests are recent, but overall the results show that charging was generally well implemented, although some devices had issues mainly relating to balancing in multi-cell devices or charge termination holding the cell voltage high, which isn't really a safety issue, it's just not great for long battery life. But if we can't find test results for our device, then are we best charging externally with a separate charger? Well, maybe, but then how do we know for sure if the external charger is actually doing any better? Now I'd argue that, irrespective of how we're charging, maybe it's just best to follow some common sense precautions, just so we're not relying on the charger to properly handle each charging stage. And of course this isn't rocket science, maybe disconnect the charger when it's fully charged so we're not relying on the charger to actually do it for us. And if you're using multi-cell packs, then just periodically use a multimeter, just to compare the voltages of the charged cells to make sure they're being properly balanced. And of course, if we avoid allowing the cell's voltage to fall too low, then we're not relying on the charger to correctly handle that restoration charge. Now, these aren't really major safety issues, just a bit of common sense that'll help our cells have a longer life. For me personally, the internal versus external charging debate is device dependent. For example, I might be aware that some mods have a fragile USB socket, or maybe some other issue to maybe prefer to charge externally. Mooch has made a really interesting video on this exact topic, so why not pop along and take a look at it? Now we've all seen dramatic videos of fire and explosions from mistreated batteries, but what actually are the real life consequences of mishandling your lithium ion cell? 
Well, manufacturers' data sheets sometimes show test results from what they call reasonably foreseeable misuse conditions. Here's the results for the 25R, where they were subjected to a short circuit, impact, crush and a hot oven. And in fact, the most dramatic thing experienced during all of these was just a leak. There was no fire, smoke or explosions. I know it's a bit disappointing in a way, that, <laughs> but since 2019, all lithium-ion batteries intended for portable use must pass tests for all these conditions, and actually more besides. It's all been laid down in international standards, which anybody can go and look up if they're interested. Now, obviously, who knows if any of these AliExpress specials have passed these tests, but maybe it's another good reason to buy a reputable cell from a trusted vendor. Now, we've already mentioned a few points which are sensible for safety and cell longevity, and it basically boils down to sticking to within the manufacturer's specifications. So, just to finish, I'll emphasise a few points which I found of particular interest. Now, we all know it's bad to charge cells when they're hot, but it can be just as bad for cold charging too. Now, obviously, not many of us are going to charge when it's this cold, but it's worth a mention. And it's wise to replace any damaged battery wrappings, particularly if the damage is near the positive side, where both polarities come like really close together. And they're fairly simple to repair, as I showed in a previous video, so you might want to check that out. If you intend to carry a vape around in your pocket, make sure it's switched off, or at least locked from firing somehow. You might want to blow your socks off with your vape, but perhaps not set your pants on fire. And cells eventually do wear out and die. So I'd say, forget these YouTube battery tricks to revive tired old cells. If you've had yours a few years and you've had some good use out of them, then get them in the recycling bank and treat your vape to some new ones. And you might want to consider buying a vape with a built-in battery. I mean, the cells for these are generally made to fit the shape of the device. There's no battery terminals or battery compartment door to worry about, and the whole thing can be smaller and simpler. And in case you're not aware, if you're charging via the USB port, it's perfectly okay to use a USB supply that's got a higher current rating than the intended charge current. It's the voltage of the USB supply that's the important thing, but since the standard for these is 5 volts, then this really isn't a concern. And overall, just look after your batteries. In other words, please don't do this. Hope you found the video of interest, maximum respect, and I'll catch you again very soon. Bye-bye.